this uh, lecture in our leadership lecture series featuring our alumni. Uh, Dr. Ram Sridham is a 1980 BTEC civil engineering from IIT Madras, classmate of our director. He is currently the chief of uh, software and systems division, information technology laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, in Gaithersburg, right? Gaithersburg, mm -hmm. Maryland. Um, before joining that division, he was the leader of the design and process group in the Manufacturing Systems Integration Division, Manufacturing Engineering Laboratory, where he conducted research on standards for interoperability of computer-aided design systems. He has also managed the Sustainable Manufacturing Program. Before joining NIST, he was on the engineering faculty from 86 to 94 at MIT, and he was instrumental in setting up the Intelligent Engineering Systems Laboratory. He has co-authored or authored nearly 250 publications, including several books. He was a founding co-editor of the International Journal for Artificial Intelligence and Engineering. In 89, he was awarded a Presidential Young Investigator Award from NSF. In 2011, he received the ASME Design Automation Award for his work on computer-supported collaborative design. He's a fellow of ASME and AAAS, life member of ACM, senior member of IEEE, and life member of AAAI. He has a PhD, MS and PhD from CMU. Uh, we are delighted that uh, he's able to join us today. Um, unfortunately, the student attendance is a little thin since our semester got over a couple of weeks ago, but I think I see a few faculty here, which is uh, very good. Um, I think uh, he wants to also talk to us about some possible or potential opportunities for our PhD scholars to spend time at NIST and um, I'm sure that many of us will be interested in finding out about such opportunities. So I welcome Dr. Sridham to deliver his talk. Thank you very much, Nagarajan. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, I uh, say that IIT is the foundation stone for, which was laid for my future. So for those of the students uh, in the audience, you guys are really lucky to be here because the best five years of my life that I spent was in IIT Madras. Okay? So those are the kinds of connections that we made and a host of other things, the professors we had here, and things like that, it's very hard to get there. Trust me, because I was at IIT and I taught at MIT, so I knew, I know both of the institutions around here. I think these are the two top institutions in the world at least, okay? So we should claim. And, uh, and, I, and then I can see uh, the kinds of things that we learned at, uh, at IIT, you can't really get uh, elsewhere in a way, okay? At least at the five-year course, I don't know about the four-year course that's being held right uh, so anyway, uh, as you mentioned that there's a lack of student participation here because of the thing, I guess this is kind of videotaped and you can uh, have a local uh, uh, on-demand basis kinds of things. If people are interested, I'm not trying to force anyone to <laughs> watch this kind of thing, okay? So what I'm going to do is that uh, it looks like most of you must have heard of this place called MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, but I don't know how many of you have heard of NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief overview of who we are and the organization I'm the chief of. And that will kind of give you a uh, perspective of the kinds of interactions that you can kind of do with us. Such, okay? Now, the National Institute of Standards and Technology is an organization uh, which belongs to the Department of, is okay? It belongs to the Department of Commerce. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's like one of the ministries around here. We call it Department of Commerce, Department of uh, Labor, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, the, we have two campuses, one in Gaithersburg near Washington, and the other one is in uh, Colorado. Uh, and our key, key mission is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by really advancing measurement science standards and technology. And, and again, we want to support, uh, we want to enhance the economic security of the United States and also improve our quality of life. Now, we kind of save U.S. innovation because we are kind of paid by U.S. taxpayers, and we have an obligation to the U.S. taxpayer to improve the quality of the life there. But we are also very much interested in making this and leveraging uh, the global uh, research and technology so that it could be good for the humankind as such. Okay? So that's uh, kind of part of things. And we focus on a number of areas, energy, environment, manufacturing, healthcare, information technology, and physical infrastructure. And we have a solid impact on, on, again, uh, trade, commerce, healthcare, advancing manufacturing, and so on. Uh, now, our U.S. economy kind of depends on uh, uh, NIST measurements as such. Anything and everything can be traced 
to NIST from here, all these applications. And we kept, the basic units are maintained by, uh, by, maintained by NIST are time, length, mass, temperature, and things like that. Uh, most of them are physical, uh, most of them are non-physical in a sense, measurement-wise, except for the mass. And uh, that probably potentially in the future could be non-physical also as such by somehow taking E equals MC squared into account and figuring out uh, how uh, the velocity of light is related to the energy and the mass kind of thing as such. It could happen potentially in the future, I don't know. Uh, again, uh, we actually do uh, keep track of the, uh, we, the one thing that happens in the United States is that we don't really use metric systems for a lot of things are standard SI units. And uh, as I was, was mentioning yesterday in, uh, in a lecture I gave, is uh, because maybe to do with the pizza problem, where we, have, we can't order pizzas in centimeters. So I came to, uh, I always carry this everywhere, I came to India and found out that in Papa John's here, they order uh, pizza in inches too. So in other words, we are going back in time here with SI units. So never, next time when you go to Papa John's, I order in centimeters and not inches, okay? Uh, so uh, here are some uh, basic stat stats and facts about us. We are about roughly 3,000 employees. In addition to the 3,000 employees that we have, we have 2,800 associates who are guest researchers from all over the world, including United States, who come and work with us. So we're kinda, you can look at it, it's 50-50 uh, kind of thing. And uh, we have four Nobel Prize winners and 70, 1997, 2001, and 5, and 2007 in physics, and we might get again a couple of more Nobel prizes, Nobel prizes. And in fact, the prize in chemistry a couple of years ago was for the work done at NIST. So, uh, and uh, we kind of have about 2,200 publications per year. We're kind of pretty active as such. So we can you can compare us with MIT and other places and things like that. And this is how we are organized. Uh, our director is Patrick Gallagher. Is uh, is the most, spends most of his time in, in the headquarters right now. Then we have uh, six major laboratories around here. And uh, I was in the engineering laboratory, now I'm in the information technology laboratory. Now one of the things that IIT education gives you is you can move from across all these disciplines. Like I got my bachelor's in civil engineering. And then I was leading a group of mechanical engineering. Then I conducted work and actually published in the medical journals as such, okay, from which I moved to be the chief of the software and systems division. And that's the kind of flexibility that the education at IIT gave, uh, gave us in our five-year program. As such, you could move anywhere into the thing. So in terms of the information technology uh, lab here, we are organized as follows. Uh, Charles Romain is our director. And we have six major divisions and a host of other support stuff here. Uh, to these two are mathematics divisions. One advanced network technologies division, we have a huge computer security division. Computer, if you look at uh, the news media, you'll see about the cybersecurity framework that President Obama has asked us to do and those kinds of things as such. So we are the organization in the United States who keeps track of the cybersecurity framework as such. Then we have uh, Ashit Talukdar who's, uh, who's in charge of the information access division and he's also very, very interested in interacting with you folks. Most of them are, but I'm just uh, he's, he's going out and reaching most of the IITs to be kind of come and work with us as such. And I am the chief of the software and systems division. Okay, in my division, what we do is that we have actually two major areas, software and systems. Software is a very interesting and funny beast though, okay? Uh, when you talk about a car and you talk about uh, 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 the car, something happening to the car, it's a physical unit as such. You can see it, you can feel it, you can measure it. What about software? It's non-conformance with any geometry as such, and that's what makes it very difficult. If I want to design a car, at least the mechanical aspects of it, I can do the geometry, I can do a solid modeling system, and I can visualize it, and I can play with it. I can use finite element analysis to see if this indeed uh, behaves the way that it's supposed to behave and things like that. I can do a lot of simulations on that and so on. What about software? Can I do it? Big problem. So on the software aspects of it, we concentrate on two things. One is measurements for software. How do you measure this software? And we call it software metrology. Metrology is measurements. The science of measurements of software. Just like you have how you can measure how the physical system reacts to external loads in a computer, we want to do how, uh, we want to similarly come up with the uh, measurements for the software world as such, okay? And there's a whole range of things you can do in here, like the formal requirements, uh, um, the bug fixes, and all kinds of things it goes on in there. And why is this important? This is important because entire things that we do from morning till night is nothing but software. From the time you go heat that cup of coffee in the microwave 
uh, use their electric tooth, actually nowadays toothbrushes are becoming pretty smart too, those kinds of things. It is all software the thing and that is why it is very important that you give, do credence to software. In India especially is when they are now talking about all these software parks and uh, uh, doing a lot of external research in I mean uh, outsourcing software and things like that and this becomes very important. The second one we do is that we develop software for measurements. Like if you want to measure uh, the dimensions of a cell or anything, okay, if you want to do any measurements, you need to develop software. And we do two things. We develop software to do the measurements and we actually test the software that was developed to do the measurements. So keep that in mind. Then there is a notion of the systems. Again, I'm the software and systems division. And in terms of the systems, uh, again, uh, a lot of things that we do are systems. The aircraft is a big system. The human cell is a system. You are a system at IIT where you have different de departments, different organizations interacting with one another as such. And then when you have this notion of a systems, the systems communicate with one another and they have to communicate in a language that is understand interchangeable across different systems as such. And that is the thing that we work on. We work on standards for interoperability and testing those standards. So the systems part of it, so software and systems. Okay. So this is in, uh, in another way of looking at what we do is that we have what, what I, my division does is that we have certain foundation knowledge that, you, that, you, that all most of my people should have as such like software assurance, semantics, some algorithmic knowledge, modeling simulation and, uh, uh, and knowledge uh, and uh, knowledge analytics or data analytics kind of thing, some statistical knowledge and things like that. And on that we do the, the vertical part of it like digital forensics, healthcare, biosciences, voting, smart grid, I will talk about the network centric societies in a little bit, cloud computing and materials genome initiative. And these are the kind of application areas that we apply in a fundamental knowledge to it, all in support of standards and measurements. That is what you need to be careful of. So what, and we have a solid impact in the day to day life of uh, the citizens. Like for example, when you talk about digital forensics, uh, uh, suppose there is a crime committed uh, and uh, there is some information in the hard drive and uh, tests are done on that particular hard drive and those tests can be traceable to us, okay. And when I say this information on the hard drive, lot of anything like a, you, you capture a terrorist uh, mobile phone or a terrorist hard drive and you get it and you want to analyze this thing and that is traceable, the software that is used to analyze that is traceable to us, it's very important. And in terms of healthcare, for example, in United States we have what is known as electronic health records. Uh, India probably does not have that problem in terms of interoperability of EHRs across hospitals because the way the thing it works is you go to a hospital and you kind of die in that hospital as such. They do not want you to go anywhere else because with all these multi-speciality hospitals, uh, they might, that might be a paradigm that, that they use as such. So electronic health record may not be a big interoperability across hospitals. However, it may be an issue in terms of when the same chain, when if Apollo hospitals for example as a chain of hospitals across the world and for them it may become, a, become an issue as such in terms of interoperability of their EHR records. In United States, the EHRs have to be tested before they are used by the doctors and the doctors when they use these EHRs in a meaningful way get paid to the order of almost $50,000 over 5 years. Now those EHRs are, are tested by some accrediting labs and these labs, accreditation labs and these labs use the tests developed by us, okay. So we develop the tests for the labs and that is the kind of impact we have. Similarly voting. Uh, machines will have to interrupt with other voting machines, so we develop the standards for that kind of thing. So there's a lot of things that we do. I don't know that because that is not the part of my talk today. So I, that's that's so much I'm going to give here and then move to my next kind of thing. This is my division organization. Uh, I'm the chief. A little more here, there, and this is uh, Barbara Gutman. She works on software assurance and digital forensics. And in fact, we actually have uh, a library called the National Software Reference Library which probably has every software that was ever sold or developed in the, in the world for a large, long period of time and you can get access to that kind of thing. A lot of people have used it, FBI and other folks have used this kind of things in there. Uh, then the two Brady's, the Mary Brady and uh, Kevin Brady uh, were husband and wife team. Uh, they work on different aspects around here. Uh, so again, I do not want to go too much into details but then if you want to work in any of these areas with us, then we will, uh, I will I will get you in touch with them. Now how do you interact with us, with NIST? There are several ways and the one thing, one way that most of people from India, France and other places interact is to this notion of guest researchers. So the way that it works is that you come to, come and work with one of our projects, something which is of mutual interest as such and then we kind of sometimes, uh, you, the, the countries uh, provide support, sometimes we provide support. We do not give you any, 
uh, salary or any such thing, but we provide a stipend to, to you guys for, so that you can live in the United States. And this could be reasonably good stipend which, which you can manage as such. And uh, we have several modes of operation in the thing. We have a one-year program, two-year program, and, for, and one of the things that uh, which is of interest to us is to see how we can leverage our research together as such in here. Maybe you can send some of your PhD students who are doing PhD on a topic which is of in mutual interest and we, and we can develop uh, something interesting out of it, kind of publish papers and uh, uh, you know, do some things which have real impact in the world as such. And uh, I, you know, those are some of the things that uh, if anyone is interested, I could talk to you or you can send me email or maybe Nagarajan has my email if you want to contact me or such. In fact, you have Professor Man, Man, Mani Manan who is sitting there, actually spent a year uh, in, uh, in NIST, uh, one or two years, I'm not sure, but anyway, so two years, okay. Uh, and I think you can ask him about uh, the experience that he has had uh, coming there. We do provide grants and contracts to universities who, uh, uh, small grants, not, not a whole lot, but most of the times when we provide grants, they are in support of our uh, research. But rec in the recent past, uh, uh, I, I see one of my old colleagues around here, some of them here, <laughs> a couple of them, okay. And uh, the, in terms of the uh, grants and contracts, uh, again, the small grants, uh, recently, we have actually done something which is a little bit different. Uh, we have given out a $5 million a year for five years grant, grant on materials genome initiative. Remember, I showed you something on the materials genome initiative. And I think a, a consortium of universities consisting of Northwestern uh, got this. And this $5 million a year are given to the universities. And they, they're supposed to work with us to develop this huge material genome initiative. We have a program on IPS where uh, professors from university, they come, stay with us for a year or uh, or two or whatever it is, and we pay the universities their salaries. We have summer students who are coming in. Uh, we have NRC postdoctoral program uh, where uh, U.S. citizens apply to this uh, national uh, research co or council or something like that. They, uh, NRC, a pro, uh, they, they apply to NRC, uh, and uh, uh, if they get uh, selected, they come and work with us. It's a nice program for U.S. citizens, but it's not offered for non-U.S. citizens and then collaborative proposals. Okay, now I'll come to the main part of uh, today, which is uh, smart network systems and societies. And you guys must have seen this thing around here. This is the kind of physical world. You are kind of sitting in the physical world right now. And uh, within a particular environment, there are all these things around here, light sensors. I guess there are some videos also on here. So there's a physical environment. There's a physical network. You have the Wi-Fi network here, and that's communicating with the rest of the issues. There are certain things which are here including my water, my, you know, the, whatever device I'm using around here and so on. And there are people, the persons who are. So what the first step around here is that you have a lot of sensing and acting going on with this thing. You're reacting to situations. The systems are reacting to situations. And uh, you have what are known as the Internet of Things. This is IoT. You must have heard of it, Internet of Things, which, where things are connected across the network. Things are talking to one another. And you've seen these kinds of things around where you have cars talking to cars. Autonomous cars and things like that. And actually, a refrigerator, microwave, all of them are really intelligent systems right now. Not intelligent systems, sorry. They are connected to the internet. So, the way it is in the future, your system will give you a call and say, uh, go get milk from somewhere and things. So, they not only tell you, it sends a text message or whatever it is. And now, nowadays, it happens. In fact, uh, you know, uh, in, in some of the houses, uh, maybe the electricity goes off. And the system immediately send, sends a SMS to your thing saying that electricity is gone. Put on the generator. Put the generator on. Electricity is going to come back. Again, it sends you an SMS. So those things are happening right now everywhere, Internet of Things. So once you give a set of control to this Internet of Things, you have what is known as a cyber physical system, that is CPS. And cyber physical system, systems are becoming very popular nowadays uh, in research area. In fact, uh, uh, IASC Bangalore has got a center of cyber physical systems. And you guys probably have something going on in that area too. Uh, so if you look at the Internet of Things, the prediction is that by 2020, we'll have 31 billion devices and 4 billion people will be connected to the, to the web. Now that's a prediction by Internet, by Intel Corporation, who I believe probably have as a vested interest in here. So this is an example of a CPS here, uh, where you, have, you are sitting in an hospital and you're connected to the Internet and somehow or other, uh, there are a number of these uh, uh, devices, thermostats, HVAC, some ECGs and things like that going on. And, Measures. A very example of simple uh, CPS system. And then the next step is you take, uh, then we go from the simple CPS system and then add uh, the following, the societies here. And in terms of the societies, they're formal social organizations. And then the formal social organizations 
have the, do similar kinds of things. You have the internet of formal so social organizations and you have internet uh, interconnected formal social organizations. When you combine these two things, you have what are known as a cyber physical human systems. I'm going to do some definitions around here and give you some examples. So that's a cyber physical human system where you have formal social organizations and cyber physical systems. Okay, here is an example of this thing where you have, uh, uh, you are kind of monitoring multiple patients in a particular ward, they're in multiple rooms, and there's a very formal, uh, there's a social organization here, there's a doctor here, and the nurse station, and things like that. Uh, now you can extend this to a little bit and say there are multiple hospitals around here, and there's a whole transportation systems, there are medical records, uh, staffing and scheduling and things like that. So now we have a network here. Now I'm going from a single unit which I've showed about a patient in a particular uh, setting to a whole network of things. Uh, thing. So here, here, here is entire uh, for, uh, formal social network and uh, uh, the CPS kind of thing. So you have a cyber physical uh, human system as such and then you have whole interconnected of this uh, CPHS where you have uh, multiple hospitals, transportation networks, patients and all, all kinds of things going on as such. And you see that, I mean I'm just giving you an example in healthcare right now but you can take healthcare and put something manufacturing or things like that, you'll see very similar things. I think. So now I'm going to add one more set here in terms of the social networks. And yes, just like you have uh, cyber physical systems, cyber organizational networks, we have cyber social networks around here. So when you combine all these things, you have what are known as the interconnected cyber physical and social networks. So, and uh, I also, the other name I give it to it is the smart network systems and societies as such. So we have three things here, cyber physical systems, cyber organizational networks, and cyber social networks, and all of them kind of form anyway. And this, I think, is the future. Okay, now I can stop here and finish. <laughs> well, how can you make this happen? Uh, we'll talk about this. Here is an example of a uh, uh, thing where you have very similar condition as uh, before, transportation, electric networks, hospitals, except that now you have the social media uh, of both the doctors and the patients coming into picture. Okay? So there are several applications, the smart cities, smart manufacturing. I think in some of the places in India, they might be uh, instrumenting uh, some of those uh, cities with, with sensors and things like that, especially Mumbai and other areas where you have likelihood of terrorist attacks and so on, uh, we are being sensed all the time. And uh, so what are the key components of uh, a, a social, a, a, one of these SNSs? There are three major things. One are things, like things which are part of this uh, whole uh, uh, ecosystem, like mul mobile personal computer de uh, devices is one of them. I'll tell you what that is. You have people and you have networks. The different kinds of networks, computer networks, transportation networks, healthcare networks, blah, blah, whatever it is as such. So let me just take one thing there, which is the mobile personal computing device and show you the fall and, and talk about it a little bit. So if you look at it, uh, this is, I kind of borrowed this slide from Ramesh Jain. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, the world has seen through mobile phones, uh, that is uh, the top 1.5 billion people right now have these mobile phones which are connected to the internet, okay? Uh, this is an estimate which was done a couple of years ago. Things may change a little bit. So this is the kind of thing which people talk quite a lot about making money, apps and things like that, loading apps, doing some interesting things. There are a lot of business models on these things, a lot of small startups in California area to exploit this particular thing as this. This is, I'm calling this as a mobile personal computing device and it's also a sensor, okay? It does more than just what a phone does. So it's a camera, it's a sensor, it's like a, it's a bird, it's Superman, have you heard of those things? It's the same thing, okay? Then you have the middle 3.5 billion people who are at the middle of the pyramid and uh, they are actually connected to the uh, cellular networks but they don't really do too much with the internet as such. The potential connection to the internet but they don't do the thing. Then you have the bottom 2 billion people and these are the people who are uh, mostly in India and uh, Africa and in those places uh, and they are the people where uh, they are not ready but in the future you never know. Uh, there is the, so you can see that once you hit this 3.5 billion people or so, the markets are gonna change completely when they get into this business of uh, using these internet, of these mobile devices across the networks and things like that. Yeah. Everything is gonna change. So, I mean, this is what is happening in the United States as such, as, as I see when you go to Disney World, you'll see all these five-year-old kids actually working on something like this. We don't know what they're looking at, but uh, uh, that's the way that people, they're growing up. It says it's, as you can see here, IEEE Spectrum had this uh, whole issue, uh, 912, uh, growing up, uh, you know, it'll start as a nanny kind of thing. And uh, that's where things are right now in the United States. So. And some places like Korea, they are uh, actually much more advanced. 
So if you take a kind like iPhone like this, and then you attach a device to the thing in the back, which is uh, sold by this company called Alive Core, uh, you actually can get the, and then touch these two things as such, you can get your UCG. And you can see if there is some uh, irregular arithma or something like that. And there's a guy named Eric Topol who I think wrote a book called Creative Destruction of Medicine. I don't know how many of you have read that particular book. It's a very exciting book. It talks about the future of healthcare thing. And in fact, it seems he was carrying one of these devices on a flight and someone had uh, breath, uh, uh, difficulty in breathing and he actually took it and put it on the guy and it measured his uh, ECG and there was some irregularity in there and things like that. Okay. And imagine that a device like this is now transmitting to a uh, receiver here and through the hospital the amount of data that you're going to generate. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, now I just talked a little bit about things. And now I'll talk about the meat of that uh, whole talk is what are the research challenges in there. So I'm going to talk, do the following. I'm saying that there are going to be seven research challenges uh, around here, okay? And we'll again come to the term why seven later on. Some of you must have heard, uh, have seen this before. Uh, security and privacy, interoperability, knowledge representation, uh, data and knowledge analytics, network behaviors, human computer interaction, and architectures, and each one of them are important and you can be doing work for the rest of your life, some of them, okay? In terms of the security and private privacy, you have both the issues of uh, device security, wireless security, data security, that's the security part of it, and then you have a whole notion of privacy thing going on. I don't do work in that, but, and again, the purpose of this talk is not so much about what I have done, it's, a, it, it's more about what can be done in the future, and there's some, uh, I'm thinking aloud in a sense here, so that the, if you guys get some ideas that you wanna work on something, we can talk about it. And what are the challenges? One of the major challenges we have is just the notion of standard development for these standards for these particular devices. Uh, there, are, there are lots of them and they're not really standardized as such. There are a lot of transmission uh, mechanisms and things like that. And the notions of protocols, I don't know, uh, if people we have work on information security, uh, presumably you have a big group in that area in terms of computer security and things like that. And then there's this whole notion of network, uh, modes of network vulnerability and uh, how people can access them and do some, uh, uh, put malware in there and do all kinds of things as such. I mean, these things will have to be considered when you're talking about a smart network system and society, okay? Then there's this notion of interoperability because we're talking about these things, people and all of them on a network and they're talking to one another. Uh, and uh, one, of the, and one, one of the things that we do, again, uh, my, all my examples are in the healthcare world uh, where you have, uh, like for example, physicians, of uh, information goes to laboratory, the cardiologist, radiologist, surgic, surgeon people, surgery, things like that. I mean, these are all the doctors who are di different parts of the city, maybe different parts of the country, maybe different parts of the world. And especially in uh, uh, Europe, you have people uh, using medical records in different countries, speaking different languages. Uh, so, and then you have huge amounts of data which, is being which are being generated here at each of these places, and they have to communicate with one another. Uh, so there is a, uh, both, so the communication is, has to be both syntactic and semantic as such. And that's a fundamental problem in terms of go, taking your electronic health medical information from one hospital to another hospital. Uh, so we can see this network of uh, various uh, folks working in here. And uh, these are some of the standards that uh, we have been working on and we have been testing those standards in this area. It's again in the healthcare area. Then there is uh, this whole notion of devices. You have healthcare. Uh, electronic health records, and they also have devices. And uh, devices, uh, this is an operating, have you, has anyone been in an operating room at the thing of uh, being a surgeon or experimenting on you? No? No, sir? Professor Maniwan in here has uh, got something which is experienced maybe like this, okay? The thing is that they can't find where the patient is if you looked at it before. And actually the patient is here. Okay? So this is the problem we have in current day operating rooms. That they're a big mess. Uh, things all over the place, uh, cables all around the place and things like that. And ideally what you would like to have is something like this, everything neatly laid out, devices talking to one another, interoperating, things like that, so that when you give that uh, uh, anesthesia thing to you, then nitric oxide, whatever it is, and uh, someone has to put something else, and these two devices interact in a manner which is safe and uh, kind of don't kill you as such. And that happens a lot because the devices are not talking properly, people tend to die in the operating rooms, okay? So there are certain standards which are, uh, uh, being generated in this and uh, there are two types around here. One, are, one is in the patient care devices in the hospitals and the other are the personal health devices. Now, why the personal health devices are becoming very important right now. In fact, you can get some neat apps like Nike and all kinds of things 
around on your on the thing, which measures certain activity that you do around here, how much, how many miles you have given, taken, how, what you have eaten, and what, how, when you have taken your, when you have to take, supposed to take your medicine. Your blood pressure is constantly being monitored, and the glucose levels are being monitored and sent across, and all kinds of things are happening around here, and you need appropriate standards to interoperate and things like that.